Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Market5. I'm your co-host, Joel Elkan, and along with Spencer Israel, and we have Tommy Lackey Jr. on the line. He's the founding partner and CIO of the Barber Lackey Financial Group. Tommy, you've been getting uh, getting some good interaction in the chat. How you doing today? I'm doing great this morning, guys. How about y'all? Well, we're doing good. We're doing good here on this Thursday morning. We're in our new digs here in the Motor City, overlooking a uh, gorgeous uh, Campus Marshes Park and Woodward Avenue. So you're going to have to make a trip here to the D to visit us soon. But uh, awesome. yeah, going to the chat here, I just wanted to address this question. Rob Hood is always patient, always throws a lot of good questions in there. And um, he wanted to just to have you touch briefly on talking about RSI over different time frames. So could you just touch on that before we get into some uh, individual issues? Sure, I'd love to, because RSI is really the main momentum indicator I use, but I don't use it as much as just a simple momentum indicator as I do as a trending, trend-following indicator as well, by using ranges in RSI. Most people look at the peaks and valleys over 70, under 30. And if you look at my charts, I don't use those at all. I use different ranges from 20 to 60 is a bear range, and from 40 to 70, if it oscillates back and between there, I mean 40 to 80, is a bull range. And so in looking at that, it gives you an idea to be able to follow trends more instead of every squiggle end up trying to jump or make a change. Now, what Rob was asking about is different time frames and how I use it. Well, I use it pretty much the same on all time frames. Um, I always use the 14 period. And I studied for a couple of years with Andrew Cardwell, still in very good friends and, and work with him a good bit now, who is pretty much the RSI guy. He developed a lot of this research on it to really dig in deep and use it very heavily. The one thing I would say to Rob and anyone else who's looking at RSI is to realize that any momentum oscillator, the lower the time frame you go intraday, things like that, the more range you're going to have, the more amplitude you're going to have. And so you just got to make sure you factor that in a little bit. Example, with a uh, with the 5 or minute chart or 30 minute chart I follow during the day, if it runs outside of those 60, 40, or I mean, I'm sorry, 40, 80 range or something like that a little bit, I give it a little more room than I would if it was outside of on a weekly. And so that's an important factor, but it's something that I use a little more extensively in my trading than a lot of people do because a lot of people find RSI hard to use because it does have a lot of squiggles. All right, Tommy. Now, you have a couple different ways to approach the market. You like to do your homework at night, and you like to focus on the nitrous scan. Uh, tell us a little bit about the nitrous scan and uh, what's yeah. popping up on the radar today. Yeah, the nitrous scan comes actually out of an RSI derivative, which is the nine moving average of the RSI, not of price. And once it gets over a certain level, it's shown in a lot of studies I've done. It's no, no indicator is perfect, but it's shown that you might be at a point that you might see some more acceleration. If y'all are car guys up in, there in Detroit, you know what nitrous oxide is in a car. Something you don't use very often, but when you hit it, it sends you on down the road pretty quickly, and that's what the name here is. That a lot of times when you hit that signal, there's a good opportunity to accelerate from there, even if you already feel it's moving fast and already you know, maybe a little ahead of itself. So it's something to watch. I use it on different scenarios. Basically, I use it mainly just to pull out names that I want to look at because the chart is really what is the ultimate arbiter for me. It's not just the scan. I look at the chart and I try to look at kind of where things are. A um, couple we see today, uh, one on there is WIN, W-I-N, WINSTREAM. Now, this is a higher dividend player. It's been coming on a little bit, and it just recently got back up towards these highs after making a higher low. Um, it's one I would certainly be looking at because the RSI just moved back into a daily bull range. Um, and the weekly, if we can, if we can clear this eight area, let's say, it's going to move up above 50 on the RSI, which gives, you know, back above that mid level. So that's a good one, I think, to look at it, especially for guys who want to take a little longer time frame because this is such a high dividend payer as well. Okay, um, nice. The next one I would say that I looked at last night that I like the way it looks. Um, on there was Lenar, L-E-N. Okay, what are you seeing in Lenar? Um, I like the home builders anyway. Um, not, not involved right this second, but I've been looking for a way back in. 
Um, got out a few weeks back. But basically, if you look at that weekly chart on that one, it's very nicely consolidated. RSI has what I call a mushy trend. Since all the way back in Latin, July of 2014, the weekly RSI has stayed above the 40 range, meaning it's in a bull trend. You can see there's a heck of a run there. Now, the, I mean the weekly, sorry. Now, if you flip down to the daily, it moved into a bear range, actually back in late August with that drop. And it's just now thinking about moving back into a bull range on this one. And it also looks like it's trying to break a daily downtrend line right here um, off of those uh, August highs. And so this is one that, you know, could be a mover today because we have some home builder info out today. Um, and it may be that it's just now starting to get to that point to where it wants to reassert itself. All right, and uh, also uh, you mentioned here uh, Mattel is a, is a relative strength gainer to keep an eye on. Well, that's, that Mattel, yeah, Mattel is in my other scan, which is the relative strength gainers. I have a proprietary relative strength calculation that's a three-month calculation, so it's designed more for swing trading and shorter-term position trading or trying to find things closer to the turns. And this is one that has been moving up. It's moved back up to the top of this range and popped up on that relative strength uh, mover scan or gainers section last night. And, again, it looks the same thing. If it can get over this 24 area and hold um, for a little while, it looks like it may be trying to go up and challenge that downtrend line or to get through it. Um, and that's a major downtrend line coming off of uh, early 2014 back all the way up at 48. Now, again, don't look for it to get back to 48 anytime soon. But a move here from 24, even up to what I would consider the next uh, decent area on the weekly charts, if you want to give it a little time, is you got 25.30, and then you've got, uh, I think, more likely that 27.30 or 27.20-ish area is probably one that, that it can see, especially when it's going into the holiday season. All right. Uh, so you have, um, I see these stocks here, uh, TUP, Tupperware Brands, and Shoes, mm -hmm. EVC, OHI. They're, they're coming up on the Nitrous Scan. Is that something for a shorter-term trade, or what are you looking at uh, in these issues? Well, let's look at Tupperware, because Tupperware is one that kind of fits that example that a lot of people would sit here and say, whoa, wait a minute, that thing's already gapped up, it's already passed, it's already gone. But the reality is if you, again, flip over the weekly, you're seeing it's just now getting up to the previous support zone from uh, late 2014 or early 2015. So if it can keep moving higher from here, it could bust that thing out quick. And the RSI is not ridiculous. It's at 71. I know a lot of people don't like that. But we've got a gap up here that it looks like it really might want to close up around 64. Okay. Again, so that could be a short-term play. And then, as I've told y'all in past discussion, all of them, to me, start as short-term plays. They have to work to become a long-term <laughs> play. Yep, Again, that... as I've said, I said many times on the stream, every new leg starts for the bounce. Right. And that's when you get your information, is how it acts during that bounce is what tells you whether you should stay with it or leave. Right, and uh, the longer you're in the trade, the better. If uh, the shorter trade, chances are, you know, you're wrong, and you got to stop out, and you can move on to something else. Uh, we've talked about a lot of positive things here: relative strength and nitro stands uh, gainers or potential winners here. But you got a list of losers here, and let's go over those individually. Uh, starting with Solar City, I haven't taken a look at this stock in a long time. What's your take on Solar City? You know, I think right now, again, looking at Solar City, let me get it up here real quick. Sorry sure. about that. Um, taking a look at Solar City, it's one of those areas where it looks like it's sitting on a cliff. I mean, it really does. Now, it's back towards those August lows, so we got to be looking for the potential for it to bounce back or for it to snap back at the market to the overall screen. But, you know, there's no guarantee we're going to do that, and right now it's looking more like weakness is coming in on volume as it broke past that 40 level just recently. So I would look at it as a down move, potentially down to 30, if it wants to keep going from here. But again, in shorting, shorting is always, to me, a uh, much quicker adventure than long trades. You know, I don't like to trust them very long. If I get it right and make some money, I usually want to get out quick. Right, yeah, because the rebounds are awful violent, especially here in uh, this bull market that we've had. Uh, moving on here, we got to talk about Netflix here. 
got that yeah. as your uh, one Net of worth. your yeah one of your relative strength losers. One of my favorite stocks to try and short. Give us your take on Netflix. Now the thing about Netflix to realize is though, even though it's one of the relative strength losers, something we have to look at here is I do look at the overall. Now again, I don't think the chart's wonderful. It's down here near support. And it could certainly fall off a cliff at any given time. That's just part of the game. Um, but, you know, it's come off from five days ago, its relative strength was a 96, and it's dropped all the way to 17. A drastic move like that, you've almost kind of got to look at somewhat of a both ways play. You know, look both ways and say, okay, if it gets down to this 95, 150 uh, day moving average right here, and it decides to hold that, then I would probably be looking long. But if it can break that, then it's probably going to go back down and test those lows from the August drop. And so that's one of those that's kind of a look both ways. Um, but this drop in relative strength is what gets my attention, and then the chart takes over from there. All right. So do you, do you pay any attention to the fundamentals or news or ratings on stocks, or you just stick with your indicators? <clears throat> Bless you. Some. I follow some really good guys on Twitter that are much better at fundamentals and earnings and all that stuff. Who's that? Um, but I am Who's much that, more technically... Who do you follow on Twitter? I'm sorry? Who do you follow on Twitter? I mean, a, a lot of people, but for that kind of stuff, I like to follow uh, Joe Kunkel, Option Talk. He does a lot of good fundamental work that I just don't do. Um, and then uh, Daryl Muniz, one investor, sometimes he'll put some different good fundamental stuff, and he does more work in that area than I do. So I just pay attention to what they do. Um, but I feel that a weekly report that I, wa I write called Strength in Numbers that goes through all this relative strength, breadth, and chart-type work, um, and I go through an intermarket analysis of, of all the different asset classes, all of that, I believe that gives me enough of a macro view that I really don't pay much attention to day-to-day -day fundamentals. That's going to tell me where money is flowing in and out of every single week. And how long that lasts, we don't know. But that gives me a much better heads up than listening to a bunch of talking heads. Yep, take it, take it with a grain of salt, and uh, do your own homework. Uh, let's take a look at Patterson UTI Energy. You have that as uh, one of your relative strength losers here. Clingy, mm -hmm. waiting to sh pound this thing once it goes through fourteen, or are you trying to short at this area with a stop above fifteen. Well, again, it's kind of the both. It's the look both ways on this one as well. You know, you have the gap right here. You're closing right now, and it's tried to hold it for the third day right now. However, in the energy names, which many have been strong recently, this one has just come off hard. So you've got to doubt it. It's under all the moving averages, all that. So I would probably lean more on the short side if it can lose this gap. And you don't have to wait all the way down to 14. Um, you can actually look at it, like I said, if it loses this gap, it holds under for, say, maybe 30 minutes, which the gap is 1429. It holds under for half an hour or so, or maybe yesterday's low around 1422 or 23. Then it's probably a short for now, um, especially with the way the dollar is gapping up today. That might put a little pressure on energy. Hey, Tommy. Spencer here. We got a question from the chat. What do you think of Cisco, S-Y-Y? -Y? Uh, okay. Thank you for doing that, Spencer. I'm not real good at watching that in my charts while we're talking. So I That's appreciate what I do. that. This going to look like it's coming out of a daily breakout and a weekly breakout here. So, again, if it can come up over yesterday's highs, I think it's a great potential there. Um, and then if not, I would make sure it consolidates above this 41 area. Well, the 41 area, I wouldn't like it as much, but right now all the moving average is pointing up. It's above all of them. Weekly's looking great. Bollinger Bands are opening up on the weekly. Uh, the only thing you really have above this area that I would be concerned about at all is the 12, 16, 13 big, nasty weekly candle that pops out around 38.62. I'm sorry. Or 36.82. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to whistle in that. No, wait. Open. Um, it's okay. 4305. <laughs> Whistling Dixie. Around that area. <laughs> Whistling Dixie from Tommy Lackey in the south here. Uh, also, uh, we're just going to take a look at a couple relative strength losers, or maybe just one more and then get to some hot stocks here. Uh, VLO, sure. Valero. Now, there's a refiner that's held up incredibly well, um, you know, with the crushing oil. Kind of had to pull back here. Tell us what you're seeing in Valero. 
But I think that's a point you have to make and you got to mentally digest is that it did pretty well when other energies weren't. So now that other energies are starting to pick up, it's showing any weakness shows a rotation within the sector. We have rotations among sectors, but we also have rotations within the sector. So it was considered a safety play, so it's probably not going to see as much action here now that the rest of energy is starting to wake up a little bit. So I would be moving over to away from things like this that were the ones that held up as much and moved to some of the other guys that are rebounding. But again, just realize it starts as a bounce and it's got to prove itself to you. Okay, uh, also taking a look here at Ubiquity Networks here. Come down hard off the $36 level. A little consolidation up here. This one's coming down, uh, made a new low. Wow, one, two, three, four big day down days in a row. Looking for more follow-through on the downside in Ubiquity Networks. You know, I think it certainly probably will, but I also wouldn't doubt if we got a bounce up to that 31 level because you got some moving averages converging right there as well as a previous low from September. Um, but, yeah, overall it looks ugly. The volume looks ugly, and the weekly chart never could shift to a bull range on this run we saw over the last few months. And that right there is a big – or actually most of this year off the 25 level. That's a big signal to me if it can't shift back to a bull range in RSI. You're also seeing MACD roll over here right after getting just above the flat line. None of those are good signs. Um, so I would probably be leaning more short. The question is whether you take it here for pure follow-through or whether you wait till it bounces back up to that 31 area. All right. Uh, moving on to some of the hot stocks of the day. Mickey D's historical move here. Uh, gapping and going. Just crushing people here in the pre-market and the short side here. Uh, I mean, is this something you just, you know, just wait it out for a day to two to trade. It's, if you're long, do you take profits here? Move your stock. Give us your take on Mickey D's. I love it. I think there are a few different ways to play it. I think the breakout looks like a good breakout. It can certainly pull in. I put in the chat earlier as long as it uh, closes over about 104. I think we're losing, looking okay. That would close the whole gap, but see where it goes. I don't think it's going to head back down there the way it's acting right now, but it could go back down to the 107.50. You get it back inside the Bollinger Band. What I would probably do here is I would look at it as a, you know, watch it for a little while, like Mike was saying um, earlier, and then basically take a look and see what you play. If you're playing individual stock, you have to be a little more careful, you know, but it's one of those areas to where maybe if you're playing options, you do a uh, calendar strangle or something like that to where you buy a longer-term upside call and you buy a shorter-term downside put. So you're kind of, again, looking both ways, but you have, you're have you definitely leaning up over time. Okay. All right. And uh, just a quick look here at Valiant Pharmaceuticals. What a wild child here. Yeah. <laughs> any, any input except to stay away in this one? Yeah, I mean, well, I think, yeah, to some extent to stay away, but I think it also, again, it's been so news-driven. Yesterday was really the big news day, and I think it dragged the whole market down with it. And so I would be looking for it to bounce around in this range that we had yesterday, but watch it to clear either one. I mean, it could clear either side. And I'll tell you, if it goes over that 120 range, or I would even say over the overnight highs around 120-ish, if it clears that, I bet it gets some action, even if it's only short term. It's just one of those things that you really got to be an intraday player to try to get in right now, or you got to be a forever player. <laughs> but I would not want to be a forever player in this one because I don't, I don't, know what the news is yet i don't know the truth of it yet all right we've been on the line with tommy lackey jr he's the cio of the barber lackey financial group a uh, unique outlook on the markets with his uh, relative strength movers and nitro scanners tommy a pleasure is having you on as always we'll talk to you again soon thank you guys so much i'll have a great day good luck out